Good morning, my dear brothers and sisters. Good morning. And to all those that are in our Zoom, a pleasant uh, good morning to, to all. Reading again our scripture that was read a while ago. It reads, but when the right time came, <clears throat> God sent his son, born of a woman, <clears throat> subject to the law. God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law. So that he could adopt us as his very own children. And because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out, Abba, Father. Now you are no longer slave, but God's own child. And since you are his child, God has made you his heir. You know, because the father loved us so much, he sent his only son, who loved us very much as well, just like the father. You know, to give us freedom. To give us freedom from the slavery of the law. You know, the cross of Christ represents freedom. And I want to thank our uh, brother Kennedy for expounding about the Lord's Supper. Again, the, the, uh, the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, it represents freedom. You know, the opportunity for all of us to be free from the curse of the law. Now, Jesus came here to buy us out of our bondage to the law, wherein there is sin and there is certainty of death. It says in our scripture reading, God sent him to buy freedom for us, who loves uh, freedom for us who were slaves to the law. Because in that law, according to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 12 to 13, remember that at that time, you were separate from Christ. During that time, we don't have Christ with us. We are separated from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise. We are without hope. You and I, we are without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, who once were far away, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Now, isn't that wonderful, my dear brothers and sisters? Isn't that amazing how God could think, how God could think such a way of sacrificing his own son to give us this wonderful gift? Gift of freedom, gift of hope, gift of citizenship, gift of belongingness. Now, do you want another wonderful gift? Do you want another amazing gift from God? Now, with that freedom comes also another wonderful and amazing gift from God. You know, Christ did not, he did not just cut the shackle. Because once, before we were slaves, we have this shackle. God did not just cut that shackle of slavery and just let us go on our own. No, he did not do that. He gave us what? He gave us a family. In the scripture reading, again, <clears throat> God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law. Now listen to this. So that he could adopt us as his very own children. He bought our freedom so that we could be and we can be adopted into God's family. So we have now a family in God. Before you and I, we are astray. We have no family. We don't have a father to call father. 
But when God sent his own son, he gave us this wonderful gift of family. He gave you to me, and he gave me to you. We are brothers and sisters in the Lord. God gave us this wonderful family called the church. Before, again, we don't have this kind of family. We are now God's own child. Isn't that a wonderful gift from God? And it says there that you can now call Abba. You can now call God Abba, your father. And we should take pride in that. We should take pride in calling our God Father. He had given us that access to him by giving us his only son. Now, but before we have that freedom that we are talking about, a huge price was paid for it. A very huge price was paid for it. Apostle Peter reminds us, for you know that it is not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ. Amen. With the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. That was the price of our freedom. And this morning, the lesson that will be presented to you is very close to my heart. And sometimes I try not to get emotional when talking about this topic. The road to freedom. What is the road to freedom? This morning we will look into again what Jesus went through to give us that freedom, to give you that freedom, to give us what we are enjoying right now. Now, this event in the life of our Lord Jesus Christ is what I love and cherish the most. Because for without it, the gospel will crumble. For without it, all that we read in the scriptures are all lies. For in the sufferings and death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, it were lies the center message of the Bible. A few weeks ago, we discussed about John 3.16. And this morning, again, we will go deeper to John 3.16. Again, the core message of the Bible is about God's love. The road to freedom. It started with so much accusations. Jesus was accused of many things. Have you been accused of sorts? Have you been accused by your fellow? How does it feel? How does it feel to be accused of something that isn't true? Are you glad? No. No. It hurts so much. Right, Being accused of something that isn't true. Jesus was accused. He was accused of being a sinner. He was accused of being a sinner for hanging around with sinners, with tax collectors. He was accused of eating and drinking too much. They accused him of being in the league with the devil for casting out demons on the Sabbath and for giving man his sins. He was accused of blasphemy, calling himself God and making himself equal with God, which he is. Being accused of something that he really is. Being accused of something that he was not. That is just a part of the road to our freedom. And that road to our freedom, Jesus dealt with a great deal of stress in his life. And in that part of his stress in his life, in Luke chapter 22, Jesus prayed. He was so depressed. Anxiety was over, too much overwhelming. He prayed to God, just like you and I. Being human, 
he prayed to the Father. And he said, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. I am no medical expert, but according to some medical expert, the sweat like blood, a condition known as hematidrosis. I hope I got it. I got that right. A very rare medical condition that causes you to ooze or sweat blood from your skin occurring under conditions of extreme physical or emotional stress. The stress or fear such as facing death, torture, or severe ongoing abuse. Your capillary blood vessels that feed the sweat glands rupture, causing them to exude blood. Our sweat gland, the glands that produce a sweat, the capillaries in that sweat gland ruptured because of so much stress that your sweat and the blood from that rupture mix together and you are sweating and there's blood. Leonardo da Vinci once wrote about this person, about the soldier who went into a battle. After going into a battle, he wrote that this person, his sweat is like blood. That person has no cut. That person has no wound. He was sweating, but it was all red because of the fear and sheer stress in the battle. But the point of the matter is, my dear brothers and sisters, Jesus went so much, too much stress that he prayed to the Father. That he was shaking, praying at the garden. And that there was an angel sent by God to comfort him. And then he was sentenced to die. The road to freedom means the death of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Matthew 26, 65 and 66. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look, now you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? He is worthy of death. They answered. You see, Jesus Christ was sentenced to death for telling the truth. For telling that he is God. He is the son of God. Came down from heaven to save us from our sins. And yet the people thought that he was crazy. People labeled him as saying blasphemous words. Blasphemous remarks. And that is worthy of death. He was sentenced to death, but not just any ordinary death, mind you, my dear brothers and sisters. He was sentenced to a cruel death. What shall I do then with Jesus, who is called the Messiah? Pilate asked. They all answered, crucify him. Why? What crime has he committed? Asked Pilate. But they shouted all louder. Crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. Remember the two thieves on the cross beside our Lord Jesus Christ. One was mocking him and the other was rebuking the other person. The one person mocking him, he was continuously mocking Jesus Christ. If you are the son of God, then save yourself and save us. And then the other person was rebuking that other criminal. He said to that person, this Jesus, he was hanged here for no apparent reason. He did not do anything wrong. He did not deserve to be here with us. But we, we deserve to be here and hung to our death. You see? Jesus Christ done nothing wrong to deserve such a cruel death. 
Your Lord and Savior and your Master was sentenced to die on a cruel death on the cross for doing nothing and for telling what are the truth. And he deserved to die. What they did, they spat and bit our Lord Jesus Christ. Then some began to spit at him. They blindfolded him, struck him with their fist, and said, Prophecy. And the guards took him and beat him. They blindfolded your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and they hit him. While hitting him, they were mocking at him, telling him, If you are the Son of God, who hit you? Kind of people are these people. They were beating him, they spat on him, and they asked him, Who did that to you? See, I remember Jesus' words in the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5, verse 39, when he said, If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn them the other cheek also. You know what Jesus did? He did just that. I do believe he turned all his body to them. In Isaiah chapter 50, verse 6, I gave my back to those who strike. Not only his cheek, but he gave his back. And my cheeks to those who pull out the beard, I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. He, he mounted up. He took every blow those Roman soldiers could throw at him. He did not hide his face. He did not hide and you know, go running and hide. No. He took every beating that they can possibly give to my Lord and Savior. You know, Roman soldiers, they were trained. They were trained for combat. As an in their early stage in life, they were trained to fight. They were trained to fight. They were all very ripped. And they are trained for battle. You know, one expert commented that a single blow from a Roman soldier can inflict so much damage and can even kill a person. Can you imagine? A single blow to this Roman soldier can kill you. And how many blows did Jesus receive from them? Who knows? Who knows? They inflicted so much damage in our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you want to imagine what happened to Jesus Christ? According to Isaiah, if you will use your imagination, according to the prophecy. But many were amazed when they saw him. His face was so disfigured, he seemed hardly human. And from his appearance, one would scarcely know he was a man. According to the prophecy of Isaiah, pertaining to our Lord Jesus Christ, he was so disfigured. Can you imagine being beaten not just by one Roman soldier, but many Roman soldiers hitting you one after the other? Probably kicking you one after the other. And Jesus Christ absorbed every bit of those punches, every fist. He took all of those. Can you imagine? what he looked like after they beat him. Now imagine that. Imagine the disfigured face of our Lord Jesus Christ. Not only that, Jesus was flagged. He was a scourge. Mark 15, 15, wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them, 
he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. They say that when a person is flogged, that person is tied to a post. That person is tied to a post and then the soldier will whip him with all his might. And they use what they call the flag room or the flagellum. Flag room or flagellum. It is actually a, uh, it's made out of um, leather. And at that end, it has nine spikes. That's nine spikes. And a, a person, will be stripped of his clothes, he will be tied to a post, and he will be whipped from all over. That's why Jesus said he gave his back. He gave up his back. The soldier can whip that person anywhere he wishes. Thighs, legs, buttocks, back, shoulders, head, you name it. The flagellum or the flag group, it was designed to make this a devastating you know, punishment. It brings the victim close to his death. It has uh, two small balls of lead or iron, just like what you're seeing here, attached at the end. And every whip, every time the soldier will pull that whip, can you imagine? The flesh being torn, the flesh being with that whip. And one, uh, there was this one doctor, an expert, who analyzed what happened to Jesus Christ. He wrote that when you are going to stitch all the wounds, of Jesus Christ from beating, from being whipped, he will be worse than Frankenstein. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine? Because all his wounds were so deep that stitching it together would be impossible. Now imagine what happened to your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, that Jesus' love was so powerful that he endured the most savage and cruel punishment the Romans could give to a person. And because of Jesus Christ loved you so much, he took every bit of that whip. He took every bit of that fist from the Roman soldiers because of his great love for you and I. You see, in, in, in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5, his wounds were so great that Isaiah said that through his wound, we are healed. Through that wound of our Lord Jesus Christ, you and I, we are healed. Now, a few days ago, I was working on something at my sister's house. Then my left palm got irritated. I don't know why. It got irritated and becomes itchy. So I scratch it. That's what you do when something is itchy, right? You scratch it. And I scratch it so hard. Then all of a sudden, I felt pain. I was like, oh, and my hands were shaking. And when I look at my palm, I, was, I saw a vein bulging already because I was scratching on a vein. It was so painful that my hand was shaking. Then I cannot grip because of the pain from the vein that was protruding. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the pain that is without any cuts, that is without any wound? 
comparing it with the wounds that Jesus had. See, sometimes we complain about splinter. It hurts us so much. It hurts me so much. And then I com contemplate on the wounds of my Lord Jesus Christ. I told myself, why am I complaining? Look at what Jesus had to suffer for me. And he was not complaining. He was not complaining. You see, sometimes we get easily annoyed with so many things. But when we truly look up to Jesus Christ and look at what he did for our freedom, I'm telling you, don't be annoyed. I'm telling you, be ever thankful. Never complain. Be forever thankful for your life, for every day that you and I are alive, for every day that we have this breath of life, that every day we are able to open our eyes and see our loved ones. Even if life is hard, who said that life will not be hard? Nowhere in the Bible that you can read that. You see, we easily complain about so many things. We easily complain about small things. But I want all of us to look to what Jesus did for your freedom, for my freedom. Think about it again and try to complain. You see, his body was full of wounds and his body was full of cuts. And that's not all. To add insult to injury, they gave him a crown of thorns. They gave Jesus the crown of thorns because Jesus, he is the king. So they mock him. Since you are a king, you must have a crown. We'll make one for you. And this is the best crown that we can give you. They make a crown of thorns, put him, put it on his head. And you know what? That crown can pierce a tin can, according to some studies. It can pierce a tin can. Can you imagine a crown of thorns on your head? The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they slapped him. In the face. And then his nails. You know, his nails. His nails were iron cast. They said that the nails were around, some say, five to seven inches. And some would suggest up to nine inches of nails. Of pure squared cast iron. Now, many scholars believe and experts believe that the nails have been driven through his wrist because they say the palm cannot hold the man's weight. So it had to be in the wrist. But the point of the matter is, my dear brothers, sisters, and friends, can you imagine the nails that was used? And can you imagine the sound? Every pounding of that hammer as it hits that nail, it means an excruciating pain to our Lord Jesus Christ. Every pound of that hammer driving that nail through his flesh. Can you feel the pain? And then he was Made to carry a cross. He was made to carry a cross that they say is around 80 to 110 pounds. He was made to carry that cross under the scourging heat of the sun. From the old city of Jerusalem to Golgotha. They say that uh, the, the distance from Jerusalem to the Golgotha. They say it's around 600 uh, meters. Now, 
For an adult in his prime, I do believe you can carry a 100 pound or 50 kilos of rice, of sack of rice. I used to carry 100 pound of rice on my shoulder. During your prime. But look, Jesus was made to carry that cross after they beat him. After they flogged him. Can you imagine? Almost beaten to death. And then they will ask you, you carry your own cross. That's why he fell three times because of exhaustion. He fell three times. How cruel are these people? After beating him to death, made him carry a 100-pound cross towards up that Golgotha place. Due to exhaustion and due to heat, he fell three times. That's why there's a person named Simon. He was made to carry the cross the rest of the way. And then finally, on that cross, Jesus said, it is finished. When Jesus had tasted it, he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. And after giving up his last breath, they are not done with him. The Romans are not done with him. They pierce him just to make sure that he was dead. John 19, these things happened so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. As another scripture says, they will look on the one they have pierced. You see, Jesus was pierced by his side just to make sure that he is dead. The two criminals beside him, they were still alive. That's why they took them down and they broke their shin to death. But when they look at Jesus Christ, they saw him unconscious and he was not breathing. And they said to themselves, he is dead. But just to make sure, they took a spear and they pierced him just to make sure that he is truly dead. You see, my dear brothers and sisters, I'm supposed to die on that cross. I'm supposed to die on this cross. You are supposed to die on this cross. I'm supposed to die in my sins. You are supposed to die in your sins. But Jesus, he took our place. He took your place. He did nothing wrong. My Jesus deserved or did not deserve such a cruel death. I want you to know, my dear brothers and friends, that this road to freedom, our road to freedom, meant the road of shame. It meant the road of humiliation. It meant the road of sufferings. And it meant the road of death for our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus Christ took that road not less troubled, but the road nobody dared troubling. He took all the shame. He took all the humiliation. He took all the pain. He took all the whip. He took all the crown that they could give him. He took all the beating that the Roman soldiers threw at him. He bared the cross and the piercing at his side because he loved you so much. When Jesus said, it is finished, he was saying, to you, Brother Charles. He was saying to you, Brother Ryan, Brother Tony, to Manang Margie. When Jesus said it is finished, he was saying to all of us, I love you. And he was saying to me, I love you, Mike. A 
And it is because of that cross that we have this freedom. You know, Paul said in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, that it is for freedom that Christ set us free. It is because of that cross that we are enjoying this wonderful fellowship and worship that we have today. It is because of that cross that you will never be alone in this life. Because you know that you have now a true family in God through this church, through his church. Now I want all of you to look around. Look around you. Look to your left. Look to your right. Look around you. Because of that cross, you have a family. Because of that cross, you have someone to call Father in heaven. And because of that cross, we are a family. It is because of that cross that we have now that hope of heaven. It is because of that cross that you and I, we will never see decay and eternal punishment. But rather, we will see our Father. We will see our Master Jesus Christ. We will be with the Holy Spirit and with the rest of the saints and angels in heaven. Because of that cross, you and I, we will never be losers. You will never be losers anymore. Because finally, we have that victory. Because death has been swallowed up in victory. Where all death is your victory. Where all death is your sting. The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God. But thanks be to God. But thanks be to our Lord Jesus Christ. But thanks be to that cross of His. He gave us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Finally, my dear brothers and sisters, I will leave you with this word of Apostle Paul. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor is not in vain. My dear brothers and sisters, the message is yours. I want you to think that every Sunday, when we take up the Lord's Supper, think of how Jesus suffered to give you that freedom. Think of how his road to our freedom looks like. That's why this morning, I want to emphasize on that. Because of that freedom, because of that love, rather, of our Lord Jesus Christ, he gave us our freedom. We are enjoying life today because of what Jesus did. Not because what we did, but because of what he did. Before we sing our song of invitation, let me encourage all of you. If you have anything, you want us to pray for you. If you are suffering of anything, of any sort, any problems that you may have, come forward. Let us pray for you. Let us pray for you. Remember, at the right time, God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to give us freedom and to make us a family. Remember that you have a family in each and every one of us. I want you to come forward. Let us pray for you. And for those who have not yet accepted the Lord, look what is waiting for you. I want you to open your heart to our Lord Jesus Christ. Open your heart to him and accept him so that you will be with him in heaven someday. God bless everybody. Good morning.